um, it seems really important to me because I work part of my life is in a conventional psychiatric world um, where where our patients are incredibly passive. We train them. We expect them to be absolutely passive, to do whatever we tell them, and nothing but what we tell them. And we don't expect recovery. And we don't like agency. I'm, I'm glossing a bit. I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit. But, um, but that's how it feels to work in the, in this system. And, and I'm, so I'm, I'm, I've also worked in alternative worlds where we expect recovery and we want, we cultivate agency and people get better. Not everyone gets better. A lot of people, a lot of people recover, become functional, are more happy. In the conventional world where I work, it's really rare that anybody gets anybody recover. It's, it's really rare that anyone gets better. So anyway, I, I just invite anyone to join in at any time to talk about these questions. But um, so where we've, the understanding we've come to is that agency is produced by story, that agency is, is derived from narrative. And um, just to highlight that idea, which which I want to move further into, to highlight that idea, there's a paper that I found, which was an exploratory fMRI study into into this sense of self agency, um, and the areas that were associated with self agency were the inferior parietal lobe bilateral, medial, superior, frontal cortex, and medial prefrontal cortex. This is story brain. This is, these are the areas that are implicated in narrative. And so, so self-agency, we've come to believe, is results from the capacity to imagine yourself as a hero in a story to be able to produce a story in which you're the main character and you're heroic and you're doing something that has an effect on the world. So um, there's a philosopher that I found who I, I really enjoy who, who writes about agency and stories. And I guess I enjoy him because he thinks the way I think. That's probably why we enjoy philosophers. Um, he says agency is the product of, of narratives or stories. <clears throat> and um, and we have some some stories about how this worked clinically. Um, maybe Barbara will share the first one um, uh, about um, the client we talked about last night. Um, but this idea is that, um, that there's, there's many grades of narrative. So there's complex stories, you know, like The Hobbit, to really simple stories about how to get groceries. And some people don't have even the simplest of stories well rehearsed or, or well functioning. Um, so it's this idea that that even even though Daniel Dennett thinks we're all virtuoso novelists, 
some of us are struggling in our short story. And I love this quote from Oliver Sacks, who um, recently died, and Barbara's been reading his, his biography. Um, and he, he says that the story that we construct of our lives is us, um, that we become our story over the course of our lives. But, but what we're interested in is a particular kind of story in which one believes that if one does something, it will matter. That if I do something, I will have an impact on the world or myself or other people. As opposed to the passivity story in which I believe that whatever I do, nothing, nothing much will happen. Uh, which reminds me, we used to live in Vermont. There's a coffee mug in Vermont. It says, whatever happens in Vermont stays in Vermont, but nothing much ever happens in Vermont. So um, so the passivity story is, well, it doesn't matter what I do because nothing will come of it. Um, so I might as well not do anything because it's a lot less effort than doing something and and and, and finding out that nothing comes of it. or you know, there's kind of a even more defeatist story, which is whenever I do something, things get worse. Whatever I do, I only succeed in making things worse. Um, so it's better not to do anything because at least things won't get worse. So, so these are sort of the one is the one is the hero's journey. You know, the the agency story. The other is the the sort of neutrality story. I think of it as the Oblomov story, that character of Dostoevsky's who doesn't do much of anything all day long for many, many chapters. And uh, and then there's the the sort of um, Eeyore character. You know, things things will always get worse regardless. So, um, so we see people, people come to us, um, who really don't see that they that they're capable of acting in the world um, in any way useful, and they're they're and, and they're a far cry from having some sense of of a identity narrative or a life story or a rich autobiography. Um, they do have a, they do have a a life story. But it's but it's one of of disorganization or that things always go wrong or um, things like that. And um, I think of a I think of someone um, that I, whom I saw recently um, who swallows things, and her story is nothing ever turns out well. Um, things always go badly. Um, I just want to die. And it's kind of interesting what everybody does when I swallow stuff. So that's a kind of agency because, because she can get people to run around and do things. She can produce an effect on the world. And and my colleagues, you know, are are trying to figure out why does she swallow things? And and my suggestion was, well, because otherwise maybe she's a ghost. Because at least in the act of swallowing stuff, she has agency and and gets a response. Something happens. People mobilize. Ambulances come. Doctors do things. She gets um, these procedures to fish these things out of her stomach that she swallows. Um, and and maybe that's better than having than being a ghost, feeling like. Nothing you do has any impact on anything ever, anywhere, at any time. So, um, so 
So these these stories of agency, I think, um, help us to um, build planning and control capacities so that we can carry out a series of moves as part of a story. And and for this client, you know, her it, it's it's somewhat it's it's limited. It's a limited series of moves, but it's it's definitely not trivial. And and I think that um, I think it makes her feel more alive than than just sitting around with no one paying much attention to her and her wanting to die. So um, so anyway, um, so this this notion of story. This idea is that story comes first and creates agency. So first I need a story that says that um, if I do something, it will matter. And that if I do something and it doesn't work, I should keep trying or I should look for an alternate strategy in order to succeed. And um, Barbara, do you want to tell the story about the the? Okay, so there's a woman in uh, in Poland who um, was addressing this question of could story be something? Uh, that, that could, if you taught what we're, they're calling narrative competencies, could you uh, could it generalize? Um, into into life, so she had a group of of teenagers with autism, and she began working them with them with story, and she discovered that the um, that the 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 most lacking capacity was an understanding of what you do if the strategy you first employ to solve a problem doesn't work. So if you're trying to solve a problem and your first strategy is unsuccessful, there was um, a way of thinking with this group of kids that that, that was it, that there wasn't much flexibility in, in uh, reassessing the situation and kind of taking away more information and, and reinventing the strategy. So she worked on them with that part of it. and. And uh, and in any good story, there's there's a moment when the uh, the hero fails and has to try again. We we look at story as as um, very much um, the myth, the mythological story where a hero goes on a journey to discover something that they need and bring it back and solve a problem with it. So so uh, there's various elements that you you uh, work on. Uh, within that structure and within that flow that are considered narrative competencies. One of them is um, selecting a protagonist, a heroic outlook, which is the outlook of somebody who's who's doing the action. And and we really work to try to create the understanding that pretty much anything you do is actually active, that you can't really say that you are passive. And so we will we will give somebody back a story that they tell us underscoring this idea that that they're they're the hero and that what they're doing is actually even by doing nothing is making an active choice you know once there upon a time there was a young woman named Joanne and she refused to answer any questions because she was so tired of answering questions and anyway when she didn't answer questions everybody always told her that her answers were wrong so she had gone on strike answering questions so we'll work to kind of offer you this sense of agency and offer it to you in a way that might actually be more entertaining than passivity, that it might offer you a view of yourself that's, that has a little more, uh, that's more, a little more interesting and, and, and has some, I guess we offer you back the respect for agency, the respect for your participant as a protagonist. So anyway, in this, in the sense of, of um, with these kids with autism, she was working with the problem solving, you know, what happens when your first uh, when your first strategy fails, and uh, she found that they did manage to um, improve their competency in storytelling, and that it actually did generalize into their lives. And uh, there was a good story that she tells, um, and I can send the, the the link to Ron to to put up. But there's a good story that she tells about um, one of the kids with autism. Um, 
having uh, as his goal, he wanted to ask a, a woman out. And uh, he told a story about his hero uh, working up to doing that. And even though she said somebody said no a couple of times, finally it worked. And and uh, and he he succeeded in in taking this lesson and generalizing it into life and asking out somebody and and it succeeding. So um, that was the 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 uh, the talking point for her evidence of success of this experiment. So it seems like a very interesting intervention to work with people who don't. Uh, with these elements, these narrative elements, and and see if we can and we can go from the outside in to to uh, to um, helping them solve some some life issues. Okay, you guys, sort of, I hear you intermittently, so I'll just keep talking. Um, so. So in order to have agency, I'm saying that you need a story about, you need stories about heroes, stories about people who go out in the world and do stuff and, and succeed. And um, many of our clients don't have those stories, so they don't do anything. And I, I remember um, my son was struggling with existential despair at age 16, and he was he was in despair of possibility because there were so many things he could do. He found it overwhelming. He didn't know how to choose the right one, and and my suggestion to him was, it doesn't matter. Do anything. If you do what if you do something, then something will come of it, and and you'll 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 start. You'll start a process that will take you somewhere. That that if you if you want to go on a journey and you don't know where you're going, the best solution is to start is to start walking and see what comes of it. And and that turned you know he, he actually did what I suggested. I don't um, I don't know if it was because I suggested it, but he did it, and and it worked out very, really well for him. He's now. Um, a very successful artist at age 22, um, you know, living, I mean, supporting himself with art, which is rare in the United States, um, and selling pieces, you know, quite nicely. So, but who could have predicted that at age 16? He just had to do something. And, and, um, and but he had <clears throat> helpers, you know, in the hero's journey. Um, there's a hero. There's there's a problem. You know the problem was um, he had to figure out what to do with the rest of his life. He was he was the hero though he didn't actually know it. He was he was hoping for divine inspiration. Um, he had helpers. I was a helper. Uh, there were other helpers in his life. Um, he had an attitude, and his initial attitude was if one thing if something doesn't work give up. So he had to learn a new attitude, which was perseverance, to keep to keep trying. You know, if something doesn't work, try again. You know, just like the autistic kids in Warsaw, they had to learn. Well, if 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 one strategy doesn't work, try a new strategy. You know, that that trial and error. Um, it's actually quite a sophisticated concept, trial and error, that that um, you know that we build. Um, so, so this notion of, of being heroic um, and doing something that'll work is is what we're trying to cultivate with people. And I think I, I think about the the work of the group in Finland. You know that that when you have enough community, um, then um, other people can propel you into that sense of agency and. So um, the, the, the Finns in the Finnish Psychosis Project talk about, um, they talk about how people start with this um, sense of passivity that I'm miserable because aliens are broadcasting thoughts into my mind, or I'm, I'm miserable because um, God has cursed me, or I'm miserable because um, 
there's a conspiracy to, to undermine everything I try to do. And they talk about through the, through the family work, you know, to move that toward um, I'm miserable because no one in my family gets along. Or I'm miserable because whenever I come up with an idea, my family criticizes it and shoots it down and, and, let, and makes me not want to do it. Or I'm miserable because uh, whatever I do, I can't please my family. Um, and, and then eventually, one moves toward the, um, I don't care if I please my family. You know, I'm going to do something. But, but we don't always have, so we don't, in the United States, uh, Finland is, a, I think Northern Finland is a lot like Northern Saskatchewan, where I worked once upon a time, in that it was really hard to leave. It was really expensive to leave, and you had to go out by air, and for the most part, um, or if you drove, it was really slow going over ice roads, and you just couldn't do it in the summer when the ice melted. And so you, you were stuck in community, in working things out in community. And see, and, and you were stuck in a kind of way that you had no choice but to see how people affected one another. But in the urban environments in North America, we don't have that um, possibility. So, so, so I thought we would tell a story which, which maybe Barbara could help me to tell. Um, about someone we worked with um, who had no agency and and developed it. So um, so this is this was a woman who presented to me um, demanding to be fixed, which is common in my conventional role, um, and. Her, um, she, she presented me with a list of medications she tried, and it turned out to be every medicine that had ever been invented, and every combination thereof. And she'd been hospitalized hundreds of times. I, I think the, the number she presented was maybe 300 plus. Um, she'd attempted suicide. Um, so many times that it was almost countless. And I remember saying to her, it's a good thing you're not very good at killing yourself. Um, and so she said, how are you going to fix me? I said, I don't know. And then I invited her to come back. And she did. And she said, so she kept telling me her story, which got more and more horrendous every Every chapter got more and more horrendous, and you know, with ritual abuse and all kinds of cat, cat killing, and, and it just went on and on, trauma after trauma. And eventually, she ran out. She ran out of material, and I'd already figured out that she knew more about psychiatric medication than I did, anyway, especially relevant to her. So I was fine with whatever she wanted to do with her medication because I had no idea what to do with it. She'd already exhausted every algorithm that I possibly could know. So at some point she runs out of um, she runs out of material. She and and there's a there's a wonderfully rehearsed quality to her storytelling. There's a sense that she's told the story before to many different people in the past. So finally she runs out of material and she looks at me and she says, now what? And I said, well, let me tell you a story. So I started telling her stories about um, stories about he heroes and heroines, um, but not labeled as such, but just stories about characters that, that did things and, and um, Stuff happened. So, and and because she was part uh, Lakota from from out west, um, I used a lot of traditional 
Lakota stories because she identified with with being Native American. I used stories from I used Cree stories, Ojibwe stories, um, but just kept a stream of stories coming. And um, and my idea was that it was an idea that I actually learned from my grandmother, who was a storyteller. That if all else fails, tell a story. And I I think that stories change us no matter what. That a story has a medicine. A story has a power. A story is a social neurotransmitter. That that no matter how hard we try, a bit of the story gets in and affects us. And so um, so I just kept telling her stories. And and um, for a while, nothing much changed. You know, she would come in and say, "Well, maybe I'll kill myself this week." And I, I, you know, I'd say, "Well, I hope not." And um, let me tell you a story. And um, at at some point, her there was a her pain doctor. She also had chronic pain, and which most of our, many of our clients have everything, um, medical problems, emotional issues, chronic pain, the list goes on. And and she wanted me to prescribe her opiates. And the only way I I did that in those days in that setting was um, if people came to pain group medical visits, where we could work on the idea or the story, as it were, that uh, opiates actually don't help pain. They make it worse long term. And so you'll feel less pain if you get off your opiates. So um, somebody asked if I was a doctor. Yeah, I'm a doctor. Trust me, I'm a doctor. <laughs> so, um, so, so she said, all right, well, I don't, I hate people, was what she said. But I'll go to group if I have to, because I need, I need, you're wrong. You know, I need these drugs. Um, they help my pain. So, um, so she started going to pain group and didn't say anything. But we had another group that Barbara led, um, which we called Fragile Minds. And um, Fragile Minds was for people who got scared by Complicated Minds, which was a third group that we did. And um, so she started going to Fragile Minds, and, and maybe Barbara has more to say about this than I do, because I wasn't there. But from what I heard from Barbara, she sat in the corner yeah, and worked on a painting. Yeah. Fragile and, Minds um, is, um, Fragile Minds was a group, as Lewis was saying, for people who found um, complicated minds or pain group too rambunctious because people did get more rambunctious in those groups. But it was also really a place where we, we, and I would say it was to try to get a whisper of a sense of your life. So it was, it was completely non-judgmental, completely non-interventionist in the sense that I didn't make people talk, we didn't do a circle, we didn't do anything. We just, I had art supplies, I brought them out, um, we had resources, uh, and you could you could work on something, you could not work on something, um, we had music, you could, you could be off or on, people were very, within the group, it was very interesting, people were very respectful of each other within the group, very careful with each other, there was a real recognition that some people just needed this, and it was really just a place to come, and, and sort of just almost accidentally, people would find themselves doing something even if it was just doodling and creating doodles. And again, we would work with this idea that, that whatever you're doing, you, there's something interesting and, and we're not going to judge what it is that you're doing or how you're doing it. There's no, um, there's no sense that uh, you're not doing it right. There's no sense that it isn't anything but completely fascinating. 
um, no matter what it is, without being overbearing. So it was a sort of delicate group. It was a delicate process of, of radical acceptance and uh, encouragement and, you know, your choices. So it, it was really an effort to just have somebody find any tiny spark of a fuse that they could light, that they could, that they could find within themselves. Um, and, you know, paint's good because, because paint, you just, I, one of my teachers called it moving mud and, and it really is, you just move color on a page and you can play with it in a lot of ways. So there was a lot of painting that got done and she did, she worked on one painting that just started as some colors and then she, be, it began to take shape. And, uh, as it turned out, um, for about eight months, she worked, uh, on a painting, um, of a woman, uh, turning her face towards the sun, uh, which is what it turned into. But it wasn't what it started as. It started as color, and then it started as uh, it began to take shape, but it wasn't planned. So that's what it was in the end, was a woman looking at the sun, which, of course, I thought was a great metaphor. Um, and, you know, she was not very talkative. She wasn't, she didn't, she spent most of the time in group kind of, being nervous about saying anything because she was so used to people saying things about it. So it took a while before she would offer anything. It took a while before she would, and she would test to see how alarmed we'd get by statements that she would make. And we were very careful to, to um, allow things. Again, you know, if she did say that she was having a bad week and she thought she might kill herself, we did the usual things to make sure that, you know, to assess whether that was going to take place or not. Um, but she was, she was allowed to kind of be radically accepted as just a person sitting there with a paintbrush with nothing to say, nothing to contribute, and no particular reason for being there. So. So, um, so the, so this proceeded, and the. The interesting thing is that one day she decided to change. It was that radical. She woke up and said, I'm bored. I'm tired of this. I'm not, this is not going anywhere. And she, you know, she, her diet was about as bad as a diet can be. And, and of course, she knew better, having once upon a time um, been into health things, and she radically changed her diet and cut out all carbohydrates, or, um, cut out all grains, um, began eating vegetables mostly, uh, lean protein. Um, she um, got up and started doing things. Part of what ha happened instead of, of lying about part of in bed. what happened and there's no um, explanation. P part of what happened is that um, she was in group and some of the other people in group were saying things about having difficulty getting through the day and she finally one day shared some of her strategies for getting through the day that involved processes and crystals and different things. And w what was really interesting was the other people really looked up to her and all of a sudden she became a bit the elder in the group. She became, she was so experienced at, uh, at her life and so experienced at, at, um, going to hospital and trying to maintain yourself, that the idea that she could offer the kinds of things that she was able to do to keep well and that people would really, you know, want to learn them um, gave her a place in group that, that wasn't occupied by anybody else. Nobody else was talking that much about um, those kinds of coping strategies. And she had a lot um, of things that she had learned how to do. And... When she, when she changed her diet, as Lewis said, she just stopped eating for a, a few days. 
And she has a team of healthcare providers, and within the team, people got very concerned. She's starving herself. She's doing something anorexic. And but we we didn't. We just said, oh, okay, interesting, because I noticed that there were certain things that she seemed to be able to eat, and she gradually, gradually shifted into um into eating better food she would say the only thing i can eat the only i can keep down is carrots it seems and you could see that she was um telling the story that her body simply wouldn't eat these other things anymore and that she had to eat carrots and she had to eat uh, all this healthy food so that's was became a story of how she did it um Okay, back to me. <clears throat> the um, um, so during that time, she got she started tapering off of her opiates. She started throwing away her psychiatric medications, um, and in a in a relatively short period of time, was on no medication of any kind whatsoever. Her, her food was her medicine and um, with and with some minor bumps in the road she's never looked back and, and so my the, the point that I would make about this is that I I believe that that she absorbed all the toys that other people told her in group that uh, I told her in our individual meetings um, and none of them were and they were all indirect so, so none of the stories were telling her what to do all of the stories were about other people who did things and got results of one kind or another either traditional cultural stories or people in group talking about um, what they did that worked for them and and that created an opportunity for her to talk about what um, what she knew that that could work for her and as she talked as she told the story about what she knew that could work for her it started working for her she started doing it and it started working for her and so, um, so I think that in in coming to our our practice, that she stumbled into a soup of stories. And when you're swimming in soup, um, well, you 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 can't help but run into a carrot or two. So um, that. That, and this is the sense that I mean of, of stories being social neurotransmitters, that we communicate ideas to each other most effectively when we tell each other stories. And so if I tell you a story about someone with agency, it, you get the feeling of agency much better than if, I tell, if, than if I give you a command and say, go do this. And you'll say, I can't do that. <laughs> You know, one of <clears throat> one of the things that I do is is um, serve as a psychiatric consultant to a family medicine clinic, and just about every patient we see has anxiety, and every patient we see says, um, "When I I go through my litany, I say, well, um, you know, how many Red Bull are you drinking? Well, Ten. Well." Could you cut down your Red Bull? I can't do that. I need my Red Bull. Um, and um, what are you eating? Pizza. Well, well, and and donuts. You know. Well, um, could you maybe eat some broccoli? I can't do that. Um, are you are you getting any exercise? No. You know, I've got too much pain to exercise. Um, and um, the um, so they, a, they can't do anything. And, and so the task is, how do you get them to do something? And so we've been talking about maybe what we, maybe what we do is we tell them story. 
tell them stories about people who have done something and gotten results, or maybe even traditional stories. But Barbara reminds me that time is flying, and we haven't talked about speaker listener neural coupling. So let me just go forward to those slides, because this is really fascinating stuff. Um, it's more uh, neuroscience, but it's about people telling stories. And um, and it's about, so when I tell you a story, um, your brain lights up in the same way as my brain, but with a six second delay. So we're get oh here we are, speaker listener neural coupling. And so these are unrehearsed real life stories with people listening to a recording of the story. And so they're scanning the people telling the story. And then they scan the person listening to a recording of the story. And and what they found was this coupling between the, the brain areas that light up in both people. And so, <clears throat> so if I tell you a story about agency, the part of your brain that does agency is going to light up. And if I tell you enough stories about agency, it might stay lit. You might light a fire. And um, so this is just some brain pictures about um, the areas of overlap of speaker-listener and listener-listener neural coupling. And if the listener cannot understand the story, this doesn't happen. So, so they did an experiment where, where the storyteller was speaking in Russian, and the listener didn't understand Russian, and absolutely nothing happened. Nothing lit up in the other person's brain. So you have to understand the story in order for this to take place. And the implication is that there's such a thing as linguistic mirror neurons, so that um, there's neurons that register a good story or any story, I suppose, and activate those areas of your brain that are active in the teller of the story. Just as, just as what happens when we watch someone moving, the same areas of our brain light up as if we were moving in the same way that they are moving. And which reminds me that there's an interesting um, story uh, about how we learn empathy is that this idea is that it's learned through mirror neurons and that we look at someone looking at us and we we look to see who they're looking at and we discover us and and so it's that reciprocal lighting up of brain areas um, Barbara also points out that that there's a uh, an implicit story in the groups that we were we were leading that of radical acceptance that that everyone was all right everyone was okay and that there weren't any bad people in the group or or defective people but that some people had stories that didn't work as well as other stories so we're looking for the instead of labeling people as defective. We're looking for the stories that are not as functional in the world as other stories. We're looking for the stories that generate friction. My favorite example being a client of mine who started yelling at his voices in front of the gap. That's a story that generates a lot of friction in the world. The gap doesn't like that. Mothers and babies start to run away. The men in blue get called. You end up in hospital. So, um, so there's there's better stories uh, like yell at your voices behind the gap in the alley, or put on a Bluetooth headset so people will think you're a New Yorker trying to to do stock deals. Um, but 
but this is speaker listener neurocoupling. So, so uh, I think our point or our message might be that in in these environments we find ourselves in, in which community we're short on community, unlike northern Saskatchewan or northern Finland. Um, what we have to do is to create environments that are rich in story. And that um, if people keep coming, the stories w will wear off on them. The stories will get absorbed and change will happen. And that uh, as clinicians, when in doubt, tell a story. When we don't know what else to do, tell a story. Um, I'm working on the family medicine residents to see if they can incorporate that idea and in a year or so I'll know the I'll know the answer. But um but I think that's really um our bottom line is that this is the best we've found for addressing passivity and lack of agency in in our um contemporary North American urban environments of relatively sparse community and um, unfriendly psychiatric services, you might say. So it's almost one, and um, we could talk a little bit more, but maybe people have um, some comments to make. Yeah. Um I would welcome people to um, to type in questions, and I just also changed a setting so that um, people should be able to speak again, though you might have to choose to share your microphone all over. Meanwhile, I have a question. Um, when I was a young person, I'm hearing some echo from me, but I guess there's no way to stop that. Um, so, so when I was a young person, I had an experience of kind of a breakdown in my sense of story. I grew up with a lot of trauma, and then I think the meanings I'd absorbed were negative ones. And so I, I found it liberating to start thinking of things as meaningless, which including stories as meaningless, like when I would um, even hear stories, I would not focus on the plot. I would just focus on random aspects of them. And, and sort of like it was, and I think um, maybe that's what goes on in some of our clients. They've had bad stories, so they've actually tried to um, break down their sense of story, but then that leaves them kind of like passive, like you were saying, and they have to find a way to recreate story in a good way. And maybe that's what you're really talking about. I don't know if that makes sense. That was kind of long-winded. I think the uh, yeah, the um, <clears throat> you know, I think that you're, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and if you're caught, if you're trapped in a horror story, it makes sense to dismantle it and and to fragment the pieces. And then recovery puts the pieces together in a different way, so that so that we transform the horror story um, into a heroic emergence from um, a terrible place. So you could see it. Barbara points out. You could see it as very healing to dismantle a horror story, um, to deny its meaning. And I think that's, that's absolutely the case, that, that if I can take the power away from Dracula, then he's just another you know, um, dude who sleeps on dirt and, and um, 
stays awake all night. So, um, so that seems to me, you know, I, I, I was always impressed by Lang talking about um, that when, when people have what we call psychosis, um, that, that, they're, that they start naturally moving toward recovery. That, that, and that um, disintegration can be a stage toward reintegration. You know, that sometimes when the pieces are put together in a terrible way, you have to take them apart and reassemble them. Um, it's sort of like, um, you know, if your transmission isn't working, you take it apart and rebuild it so that it'll work again. So there's that stage where all the pieces are lying around on the garage floor. And it and if, if you walked in on that stage, which is what happens I think in, in psychiatry, then it, it looks um, frightening and terrible. But but in this case if, if we just put a, a shelter around it, if we can somehow contain it and keep away um, protect the process, then the parts reassemble themselves. You know, it's that, it's like that metaphor of of going down into the underworld and and being torn apart, and then putting your bones back together and climbing back up into the upper world. Um, and Barbara wrote that we like to acknowledge what it's taken for people to come into the room with us. You know that that. Suffering is the mother of wisdom, and that um, that the that the we want to provide a, a container for the pieces, and to and to gently offer some ideas of how they can be re how to reconstruct. Um, the, one of the most important aspects of the container being radical acceptance, and. The challenge in my world is to get people to come to the container because um, I get this, I, too often I get this response, I hate people, um, I don't like groups, um, nothing good ever, nothing ever works. So um, I guess that was a long answer to Ron, but but I do want to honor the disintegration process as part of recovery. Can anyone else have a question right now? I have a question. Can I ask a question? question. Um, I will, yes. Do you see there being any drawback? Or any um, anything that could be negatively associated with the hero narrative? Does that, does that question make sense? I didn't hear the word before narrative. Hero. With what kind of the narrative? Hero narrative. Oh, the hero narrative. Could there be something negative about the hero narrative? Um, I haven't found anything negative about the hero narrative. Maybe Barbara can think of something. Um, because, you know, we all are called upon. There's a, there's a Lakota concept, well, Onshila. And um, it's this notion that we're thrown into a world that's so much bigger than us that we don't understand and which powerful forces are at work that could care less about us. And and um, and that um, 
we have to get on with things anyway and make sense of it. And so we have to, we have to therefore create meaning. And so that's heroic. And that's the task that we're called to do in the world. So, um, so I think, no, there, I don't see a problem with the hero's story if the hero is the one who acts. Now, we're not talking about, um, may, a hero is different from a main character because the main character can be villainous. Um, heroes can be superheroes. I mean, I've met people who had to have been a superhero to survive the trauma that they experienced in their early life. Um, but, um, but I don't, I, I'm open to being shown otherwise, but I don't see any problem, I don't see any danger with the hero narrative. I love that um, you're defining hero as meaning one who acts. Thank well, I could I could add something. Um, you know, if 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 yeah, a hero is someone who takes action, however small. It's like that that classic um, quote from Hamlet. You know, to be or not to be, um, to um, I, I'll paraphrase it because I don't exactly remember it, but to but to lie down and and go to sleep amidst the sea of troubles, or to take arms and in and against the opposing forces and in and in doing so to overcome them, you know. So so that was Hamlet's classic choice was to lie down and and do nothing or or to or to stand up and and make opposition. Hamlet's problem, I, I suppose, because it's good drama, was that he had to die doing it. You know, so we're looking for for um, stories where you don't have to die in the end. <laughs> you know, where we get to all go home and you know celebrate. Um, yeah, but we we think it's pretty heroic to get out of bed for a lot of people. And maybe even not to get out of bed. Some days the hero needs to pull the covers over her head. And all decisions made by the hero are respected in the initial stages of the story of recovery. So it's not to say that we endorse all strategies, but we understand and, and radically accept them, even as we might try to point out the consequences. You know, because some stories get you into hospital when you perform them. So. Um, maybe not such a good idea. You know, it's interesting to me, pretty early on in my life, somebody who had a lot of um, power and influence told me a story about who I was. And um, if I had... That story actually has served me a great deal. And if I but if I had told that story, if I had fully internalized that story, and I had told that story um, to mental health professionals that I saw later on, at the time that I was told this story by someone from another culture, from a non Western culture. He was a, um, a Rinpoche from, he was a Tibetan Lama, a Rinpoche, Tibetan Rinpoche. And if I had told this story to the mental health professionals in my life, that I've seen throughout my life, I think that that might have, it could have been seen as a dangerous story, one that meant that I was deluded and had visions of grandeur and could have been seen as something that wouldn't have served me and that needed to kind of be managed. So I personally have never um, been diagnosed with psychosis, although I have had 
a number of experiences that could be defined as psychosis. Um, even though I communicated those experiences to mental health professionals, they never considered them uh, psychotic experiences. Um, cause I, partly because of this, this Rinpoche's story that he told me, it kind of helped me to um, it helped me to contextualize the experiences that I had as spiritual experiences that weren't dangerous, but that were indicative of my true nature, and that that could be, in fact, very helpful to me. So those experiences never impaired my functioning, and I never saw them as being negative experiences. But I, this, what you're talking about, about storytelling and helping to kind of contextualize experience and knowledge and in a way that can inform our action is just so powerful and so helpful. The, the Lama, the, the um, Tibetan Lama, what he told me was that he was a, a holder of two lineages in in um, in Tibetan Buddhism, which puts him in a very kind of a, a, a position of, of power. And so he, part of his, one of, some of his abilities were he could see into someone's past lives, throughout their past lives, and into their future lives. And so what he told me, and this is like an accepted thing, right? Like this is believed to like he's actually able to do this. So, and, and I, I believe that, that he was able to do that. And so what he told me was that I was um, actually a being that had, that had incarnated into the human realm from this other realm of, of enlightenment, not the Buddha realm, which is, a, you know, where the Dalai Lama comes from, but another realm that is similar to that. And so because of that, I was able to kind of have some abilities and and have some kind of like different sort of a, an agency in my life than I thought that I had previously. So the thing is, is I don't normally mention that to anyone or talk about that, and I certainly never did to any of the mental health professionals that I spoke to just because it didn't seem relevant. Um, but now that I look back on it, it may have been a really good thing that I never mentioned that. <laughs> but what ended up happening was I just kind of underwent some powerful changes that I had to kind of draw from strengths that I didn't know that I had. And so that story that he told me, like, it was like 20 years ago, has really served me because I thought, well, if I'm this other being from this other realm who has this incredibly powerful force, I'm this incredibly powerful force of good in the world, and I have this legacy that I can draw from, then I can get through this. I can do this thing that seems impossible. <laughs> and so that's the way in which it has helped me, right? Yeah. Okay, so Barbara, you're saying you have to leave. All right, well, thank you very much for being here. Um, Lewis just made an interesting comment. Psychiatry has been constructed as thought beliefs designed to keep people from non-materialistic thinking. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know, Louis. If if you have um, any final comments, or Barbara, either of you have any final comments? Um, yeah, I. Um, well, my final comment would be that we all, if every story affects us, then we probably ought to keep trying to tell good stories. We probably, I, and I think, I'm really loving the good stories about the Pope in Washington. And, and I saw um, 
uh, a short video clip of Bernie Sanders talking about the Pope's visit to Washington and, and just saying, right on, dude, you did a good thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good story. I felt uplifted by that story. I felt encouraged to be a human being on the planet. Um, you know, when I when I hear um, most of the Republican candidates talking, I'm not uplifted. <laughs> and I'm not feeling warm fuzzies inside. So, um, so I think, um, I guess my last, my final comment would be, keep telling good stories. <laughs> we need more good stories. We need more positive stories about being human beings on this planet. All right. Well, I really appreciate, um, anyway, Lewis and Barbara, for you to come and share your stories, and also everybody who joined in and, and, and shared and was part of this. And So I'll be mailing out how to get um, access to the recording once that's ready, and you can go ahead and share that with others that you think maybe could benefit from this presentation. Thank you very All right. Much. Well, thank you for putting up with us for more than an hour. I'll be back next time. All right, great. The audience. <laughs>